Okay. Okay. Uh, what I've been asked to speak about now is psychotherapy and finding a good therapist. Um, so I, I want to start by um, just for a couple of minutes talking about why psychotherapy. What's why is psychotherapy helpful for many people? We all get stuck in patterns of behavior that are no longer productive for us. All of us do it. Everyone does it. We all find ourselves doing things um, uh, not even though, even though they might not be working for us because it's what we've always done or because we've got some philosophy. Um, Edna St. Vincent Millay said, life isn't one damn thing after another. It's the same damn thing over and over and over. And, that's, and, and that goes for all of us. Um, there was a quote that was used this morning um, from Alfred Adler. People would rather be right than happy. And I, I just can't tell you how many times I've come across that with clients of mine who took a stance, um, and, and, and took a stance, married somebody that their parents told them not to marry, um, but then refused to acknowledge that they had made a mistake and spent the rest of their time in an unhappy marriage. I, I, I mean, I, there's so many examples of that. That's, that's part of being a human being. We are all subject to that. It's not because you're sick or crazy. It's part of being a human being. Our, our minds can be viewed like a car. Most people think that we start out with um, uh, 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 mini cars, and then we exchange it for a Buick, and then we exchange that for uh, a Toyota, and then we exchange that for a minivan, and then a, a bus. And it's not like that at all, if, if I can carry that analogy further. We start out with the, the mini car, and then we add on to that, and we get a bigger car, and then we add on to that, and our, our mind grows, but that mini car is still there. We still all have the capacity to fall back on those early uh, perceptions and early experiences and early ways of dealing. The first time that we come across a difficult situation, we human beings, becomes imprinted in our uh, psyches. And it, it's um, uh, uh, very common that every time after that that we come across a similar situation, we react as if we were back the first time. Like your, your boss calls you in um, to discuss something and you feel like you've been called into the principal's office. And we might, we might react in, in however we learn to react to authority figures. We might react by, by being frightened. We might react by being rebellious. We might react by, by uh, 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 saying, I didn't do it. We, uh, now, of course, we're, we're more sophisticated the way we say these things, but that's a very common human trait. It's not um, something that only uh, uh, stupid people or crazy people As we grow and develop, we learn different coping mechanisms and different ways of viewing the world. The issue is, can we change our coping mechanisms to meet the new demands of a, a, a different world as we age or as our life circumstance changes? Um, uh, being cute or conventional or unconventional or spiritual or petulant may have worked at a certain period of our lives, but when we continue reacting to the world in that way, when it's not appropriate for the situation, then we've got an issue. And it's, it's something, again, that's common for all human beings. Darwin is often misquoted as having said that uh, different species survive because of the survival of the fittest. That's, that's a misquote. What Darwin said is that the, the species that survive is a survival of the most adaptable, the species that can adapt to a changing environment are the ones that survive. 
And I would consider it um, healthy and helpful for us to survive as individuals if we can say what worked for me in the past is no longer working for me. It, just, it doesn't make sense for me anymore. If, if you still have the same beliefs and the same way of dealing with the world that you had 20 years ago, then you, you've wasted 20 years of your life. Um, I, um, I graduated high school in 1964, and when I did, I had a view of the world in terms of my idealism. And when I was 73, I'd say to you guys, <laughs> am I right? Am I right? Those of you that are doing the math, no, you're right. old, so we're over. I'm there. <laughs> okay. um, uh, no, but when I graduated from high school, I, my my view is I was going to be idealistic. I, I wanted to have the courage of my convictions. I was going to at the at the time it was um, I I wanted to be a lawyer. I won't go but uh, it was during the civil rights struggle, and I wanted to be a civil rights attorney, and I thought, well, I'll be a, a corporate attorney during the week and fight for civil rights on the weekend. So I thought, well, that's great. It, my life didn't turn out that way. You know, I, I decided to go in a, in a different direction. But, but that, if, if people that hold on to um, the demands they make on themselves as they age or as the circumstances change, might find that it, it's just not good for me anymore. I'm, since I'm using my own example, um, my first two years at college, um, I would go to the library to study, and I stayed until 11 o'clock when the library closed every night because I was afraid that if I allowed myself to leave earlier, then I would give in to my desire not to study. So I had to stay until 11. And for the first two years of, of college, the last hour that I was at the library was totally unproductive. I, 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 my mind was scrambled. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. And it wasn't until I was a junior that um, I started to say to myself, this is ridiculous. Just leave at 10. Or leave when, you, when your brain starts getting scrambled. And my grades were the same and I was much happier. But it took me that long to be able to, to figure that out. Uh, and that's not unusual. So one of the things that psychotherapy does is to help us to get unstuck from our beliefs that, um, that, that, would, that, that worked once for us, but no longer were working. And to help us to recognize we, it's good to have a variety of uh, responses to a situation. Um, not just the same response that you decided to have uh, when you were a child. We all fall into patterns that are unpredict unproductive for us. And some of the saddest people I can think of are the middle-aged cult members who um, joined when they were young and idealistic and they were going to change the world and they uh, have, have lost the enthusiasm, the fanaticism, the, um, the single-mindedness that they had when they were young, but they can't get themselves to leave the group, so they just get washed out. And it's not just cult members, many people, they just wash themselves out. And, they, and, and like an addict, they keep chasing that good idealistic high um, that, that they once had but they don't realize that it's time to give that up and to move on. Uh, on some le level, they know that it's all a lie and that they're chasing something they'll never catch, but they can't bring themselves to leave. Again, though, we all do that to some extent. The first time that we as children encounter a difficult situation or a challenging situation, that encounter can become imprinted in our minds. Um, and every time we encounter a situation that's emotionally similar to that one, we can be flooded with emotions that were similar to that first encounter. Uh, uh, former cult members will often react to authority figures in their lives by repeating the same um, emotional reaction that they had when they were in the cult, either one of secret rebellion 
talking about the person by being very compliant or by being um, uh, outraged that this person that they looked up to has betrayed them because they're they have feet of clay um, or by uh, just uh, 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 negating them. Some there's, there's a lot of different responses to it. But one of the things psychotherapy, good psychotherapy helps people to do is to recognize what your patterns are, what your character logical way of dealing with difficult situations is um, so that you can then say, well, do you have to react that way? Do you, do you, do you have to, every time you encounter this situation, do you have to do this? And the, the, um, the client will often say oh, things like, um, well, that's what I do. And then my answer is, yeah. And let me ask you again, do you have to do that? What would happen if instead of doing this, you did that? I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm not making fun of the people, right? but, but that's what people do. We, we, and again, we all do that. Um, if you are in a cult and your boss points out that you're doing something wrong, you may feel helpless or sinful or resentful or unfairly accused. And those reactions might be appropriate for the situation, or they might not. Might not. The important thing is to be able to have a repertoire of ways of responding. And that's, again, what good psychotherapy helps a person to do. Um, a, a good therapist can help you to discover whether your reaction is really based on the present day situation, or if you're back in the situation of being the helpless child um, feeling bullied by an overbearing cult leader, or the helpless child who's being told by an adult that you have to do something that you don't want to do. We, the good therapy helps you to recognize that you have a, a whole range of responses, and that when, when you first encountered this situation, you might not have had the tools that you have now. Now, as an adult, if somebody bullies you, we have the capacity to say, that's not right. You can't say that to me. That's not acceptable. Kids, kids can't, can't usually articulate not that well on the playground. Um, good psychotherapy can help us to sort out how we respond characterologically to situations so that we're free to respond to each situation and not fighting the same battles. Uh, if you have a, a therapist who um, doesn't recognize, oh, excuse me, let me say that again, who doesn't take the time to learn your patterns before giving you advice, then I would say that's not good psychotherapy. If the um, therapist says, you know, in your first one or two meetings, well, here's, here's what you should do, um, that's, that's not good therapy. It may be satisfying sometimes for us when we're, we feel we're in a quandary. You know, what do I do? Tell me what to do. But a good therapist will say, no, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you what to do. And I'm just getting to know you. I have to learn more. Um, uh, very often, uh, my, my clients will come in and say, I don't feel like talking today. Just ask me questions. And I say, no. <laughs> because then I ask the questions based on my issues, what I think is important. You've got to come up with the things that you think are important. And that means work. I, as a therapist, shouldn't be working harder than my clients are working. They should be struggling with these issues and thinking about them. And that's what I um, encourage them to do. Not to look to me to give answers, because I don't, I don't have answers. That's not my expertise is, is having answers and having everything figured out, my expertise is helping you to come up with your own solutions. So what are the qualities to look for in a psychotherapist? You want a therapist who's genuinely interested in hearing your story, who doesn't cut you off and doesn't uh, tell you what your, uh, uh, what your situation was. I had a, a client who I had seen a therapist before me and every time she would discuss her cult, the, the therapist would roll his eyes and say, oh, so we're going to go over that so-called cult of yours. <laughs> oh, I, I know, it's astonishing. It's, it's astonishing. 
she luckily had the courage to be able to say, this, this is ridiculous, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Because this guy had a preconceived notion, a, a political view of, of, uh, of, of what a cult was or, or, or what was wrong with people that got involved in cults and didn't go on the journey with the patient. So when the, the, the client, so I'm a, I'm a psychoanalyst and sometimes I refer to them as patients. I'm also a social worker and then they're my client. Um, so you want a, a therapist who's genuinely interested in hearing your story, who doesn't prejudge you, who doesn't tell you what happened to you, but who goes on the journey with you and wonders about things. And um, can you tell me more about that? And is there another way that you can think about that? And I wonder how you, how you tried this. I'm not saying that they don't, you don't challenge the individual, but you do it in a way that's respectful and helping them to look at it themselves. Um, um, it's good for a therapist to help you to see a different interpretation of an event. But this should be done in a respectful manner. That's not the same as telling you what your experience was. For example, um, no, I already gave them. you want a therapist who questions you as a means of exploring the situation and not as a means of making you feel inadequate. Your therapist should be willing to learn from you and he or she should be humble enough to acknowledge when they don't know something. If you have a therapist who tells you, I, I handle that, I have all the problems, I, you know, they, they rarely say that, but they give that impression. I've worked with people like you know, that, that story, yes, yes, I, uh, I run like hell, because nobody's an expert on everything. A good therapist is one who refers out sometimes. A good therapist, in my mind, is someone who, if you say, I'd like to um, uh, see a consultant get a, a different opinion of this. They might say, okay, let's just look at this. Or, are you sure you're not running away from uh, me because I'm making you feel uncomfortable? You know, it, it's, it's good to question it, but not one who says, if you do that, I will not see you again. I've heard, heard of that happen. That's, that's not respectful. Um, the, if, if you ask the, the therapist something, um, and they might uh, say something like, I don't know the answer to that. Let's keep discussing it and try to figure it out together. I have that happen all the time that somebody says, why do I do that? And I say, I, I don't know yet. I, and you don't know yet. We need to keep exploring. We need to keep looking at situations. When we keep seeing repetitive patterns, then we can begin to say, well, where do you think that comes from? And we can look back on the past and, and try to, to figure out where it comes from. And that's what effects real change. Uh, so it's unsatisfying to, to those people who want to go to a therapist who says, do this, here's your homework, do this, do this. Um, and, and there's some therapists out there that do that, but I don't consider that to be good, good psychotherapy. Um, the two of you should be on a voyage of discovery together. And to that end, I want to state that you don't necessarily need to see a therapist who specializes in cults. You need to see a therapist who is willing to go on that voyage with you and to discover with you and to be respectful of your situation. I would much prefer, what people call me all the time, um, I live in such and such a part of the country, that there's no cult expert here, but I, I'm really I'm having anxiety, I'm depressed, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in old patterns. And I always say to them, you don't need a cult specialist. The good thing about a cult specialist is that they know some of the jargon that you know, those of us that are, that, that are, are into this field know, and, and they, can, they can say, well, this is, you know, lift it and say this about this and, and the like. And, and that's, that's good, that, that's helpful. But much more important than that is someone that's going to say, well, have you thought about this? And can you explore that? And can you tell me more about this? And where do you think that comes from? Uh, the problem with seeing the cult specialists can be that, they'll, that they may um, interpret all your symptoms as being cult related. Um, I feel anxious. Well, you're an ex-cult member, of course you feel anxious. 
all cult, ex cult members feel anxious. Well, that 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 may be a true statement, but that might not be the the genesis of your anxiety. There might be something else going on, and a good therapist should be able to explore that with you and to say, well, I know that that's a very common uh, phenomenon for people that have left cults, and maybe that's what's going on with you, but let's keep talking about it. Um, to a hammer, everything is a nail, and you don't want to see a hammer because that's, that's not helpful. You want to see somebody who's going to explore with you, and again, a, a, a therapist who says you're the first uh, former cult member I, I've worked with, um, but let's talk about your experience. Um, that's that's going to be helpful. I have to say, I, I have also come across therapists who, when um, the uh, ex cult member says, "Have you worked with ex cult members?" Oh yeah, sure, oh, yeah. Oh, that's my yeah, yeah. And and it turns out that they haven't. <laughs> I don't know what what, what they're talking about. And that's and, and that's dishonest. Um, Oh, and I guess I should, since I brought it up, I should mention that. Honesty is something that you, that's an absolute must and deal breaker if you don't get honesty from the person. If you get somebody, I'm, I probably don't to say this because it seems so obvious. If you get somebody who adds the, uh, the uh, bill to the insurance company or who um, gives you a, a false diagnosis because it's one that's reimbursable, <laughs> or something like that, um, that says volumes to me about their integrity. I think you want somebody that's, that's going to be honest with you, and that's going to be honest with the outside world. Um, um, some other thoughts. Sometimes uh, being angry at your therapist or sometimes feeling that your therapist doesn't always understand you are not in and of themselves reason to leave therapy. It's part of the therapeutic process that people get angry with the therapist or say, you missed the point, that's not what I'm saying. That's part of a relationship. Relationships are naturally Ambivalent. It is the natural state to be ambivalent, even towards people we love, even towards uh, somebody that's helping us. Um, it, it is not the natural state to feel the zeal of, of finding this person to be the only person in the world that has all the answers, be it a, a lover or be it a, a therapist. The, the, I, I, I don't want my therapist to say, I, I mentioned this in an earlier session, you have all the answers, because I don't. I want them to say, you were helpful to me. That, that's, that's great, that's one of the better is if they say to me, I have all the answers in myself, and you helped to bring it out, and then I'm on cloud nine, then, then I really feel good. Um, so anyway, if you get angry at your therapist, you say, I'm really angry at you today, and the proper answer of the therapist is, let's talk about it. Okay, tell me why you're angry. And they might say, um, I, you, you thought that I said this, um, but that's not what I said. Um, I think you misinterpreted, and I wonder if for some reason you needed to get angry at me. That's, that's not dismissing what you say. It might be interpreting it, but, but um, the therapist who says, uh, you know, who are you to get angry at me? And, and, and uh, uh, if, if you're going to act like this, I'm not gonna see something like that. You know, that's, that's not somebody that's engaged in that kind of give and take that I'm, that I'm talking about, that, that exploration with you. Um, you don't want a therapist who is a know-it-all, um, and you don't want a therapist who uh, dismisses what you have to say without exploring it with you. Again, they, they can challenge you, and that's good. Um, you don't want to be involved uh, with a therapist who claims to have all the answers and dismisses your thoughts and feelings, um, who disrespects you, or who uses you to work out their own issues. 
Um, and I, I have to say it, it happens at times. Um, uh, so if you find yourself getting in that kind of situation with a therapist who, um, who is using you, um, then, um, then you, you, you should give serious consideration to leaving. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about the person who says, I know nothing about the job of witnesses. Tell me more about what your life is like, because I want to learn. I, obviously, that's asking you questions, learning from you, in the service of, of helping you. Um, but if you're with somebody who you, you feel is just peppering you with questions so that they can add to their knowledge base but not keep the focus on you, that's not a good situation to be in. You should have a therapist that if uh, you say, I really want to suspend therapy or end therapy or move on to somebody else or something like that, they, it's perfectly all right for them to say, well, let's, let's talk about this. Let's, let's see, because I wonder, example is my practice, I wonder if you're running away from something because you feel uncomfortable because I brought something up. That's, that's legitimate. Um, but the one that, that, that says, uh, you know, again, um, you're not going to find anyone who's better than me. I've had people come to those words. Um, finally, when you choose a therapist whose practice is informed by psychoanalytic theory or cognitive behavioral theory or humanistic theory, you want somebody who focuses on you and your story, not on the theory. Theory is a scaffolding that's used to help the individual client. Theory is not the truth. Theory is just a, a, um, a means of getting at the truth. So even though I, I do believe that therapists should have a theoretical background um, and theory that informs their practice, they shouldn't be slavishly involved in that theory and not able to use other techniques or explore other things. Uh, the, the purpose of theory is to give an explanation, a, 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 a um, um, tentative explanation to why things are happening, but theory should go out the window when the experience of the individual is different or it doesn't seem to be muted it to be helping that person. Then you got to, and the therapist has to try something else. I, um, uh, uh, I, I always um, eschew uh, uh, people that have one way of dealing with everybody. Um, the therapist should, uh, excuse me, therapy should be an experience that helps clients achieve their goals not an experience that gives um, ideologues a place to practice their ideology. You can, you can look at a hospital as a place where sick people go to get better, or you can look at a hospital as a place where doctors go to practice medicine. Well, similarly, you can look at therapy as a place where people that have issues go to work out their issues, or you can look at therapy as a place where some expert um, comes in to uh, give you their wisdom, and the former is certainly better than the latter. So that's. Oh, oh, I, I, I should I should also mention I'm not going into great detail about the difference between psychoanalytic therapy, which is what I do, um, psychodynamic therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, humanistic therapy. Um, you can find all of those differences on the internet, um, and, and I, it's, it's of some interest, but it's a, I think it's of, a, of academic interest. More important is the relationship with the individual and whether you feel that person is too in for you. So with that, I'll take questions. Shall I have a question. Um, Listen to you talk about all this, and what pops into my mind, and then I want to cross this over and over again with some abusive situations is the whole emergence of the life coach. A person who may or may not have a license or a degree, they can more uh, kind of like us exit counselors, exit counselors, they just sort of proclaim themselves such and 
and, and then practice. Um, have you run across any issues with that? Because it's, it's a growing area in the last decade. So. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I know uh, uh, life coaches who do a very good job of helping people get over certain um, areas in their, in their life. Uh, PhD candidates will very often have difficulty succeeding. And I, and I, could re I would refer to a life coach as a good one. The problem with the concept of the life coach is that it's a broad category. There's no license. And therefore, people can call themselves a life coach and not know what they're doing. Just be somebody that, I, I remember uh, our, our secretary at the mental health center where I work said to me, the only thing you need to be a good therapist is the same thing you need to be a good mother. Well, <laughs> to some extent, maybe, I don't understand what you're saying. But now you, 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 need, you need something different, right? Or more. Yeah, mother has a role, therapist. So, so I'm, I'm always wary of um, terms used to explain people that uh, don't have credentials or experience or references. And you use the term exit counselor. That's a very good example. Um, when somebody says to me, I spoke with an exit counselor, my next question obviously is, who? <laughs> and, and if they say, I spoke to Joe or Pat or Joe or somebody. Oh, okay, you could. You're good. You're a good person. But if they say somebody else who I haven't heard of, I always say, I don't know that person. I can't. I can't tell you whether I feel as they, they, they gave you good advice or not. Um, so you know, there's some generic terms. Even the term psychotherapist, there, there's no licensing for psychotherapist. There is for clinical social workers, um, psychiatric nurses, medical doctors, psychiatrists. Psychologist, but uh, psychotherapist is a generic term. So you, you have to do your your um, homework in terms of asking the person what their training is. If it's somebody you don't know, you certainly want to get, uh, if possible, a referral from um, a friend who had a good experience with that individual friend that you, you trust. I one of the very few times that happened. I've got a patient now that I'm seeing two days a week. He, he, he's a good patient and that he's got issues and he's struggling with those issues. And I'm, how did you get my name? He said, I googled um, uh, social workers in Bergen County and you have a Jewish name? I want a Jewish <laughs> So Okay, I, I mean, I, I wasn't going to chastise. I was going to say that is a dumb way. You, you, you <laughs> luckily stumbled on somebody named Goldberg. And that happens to be good, but um, yeah. Okay, so that's that's my answer. Um, I guess this is a, a comment person, not a question. I, I uh, wanted to add to your list of red flags. I, I had a. Therapist before I was out, but it wasn't had nothing to do with me leaving or staying. It was just you know after my life started falling apart, I went to see this guy and uh, and he betrayed me essentially three different times in one session. Uh, I won't go into detail unless you want me to, but basically he completely broke the confidentiality, you know, uh, pledge whatever you want to call it, and you know a couple of other things. ethical responsibility. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if you see an ethical lapse like that, you know, it's just like going to go away really fast. Um, but I'm wondering, um, and I, well, I called him out on it, and then he's, he's ever the psychotherapist, he's ever the therapist, he's, he's putting the bottom me. Yeah. He's saying, well, well, why? You don't trust me. You trusted me last week, and now you don't trust me. What, what, what's wrong? What, like, what, in other words, what's wrong with you? What, what are you thinking of? I, I, oh, I'm already thinking, you're not my therapist anymore as of this minute, so don't try to play therapist on me. That's, I'm not thinking that bullshit. You know? So I just, I, and I left. I just said, I'm going. But anyway, I, I'm wondering if you can relate that to what you just said. Of, this is sort of a different question, but what you just said about um, you could say you're a psychotherapist and not have a license. Well, wouldn't that be, isn't that a, you know, couldn't that be a legal problem for the psychotherapist, for the, let's say, life coach or whatever? Well, there, there's no license for psychotherapists. I, I can't claim that I'm a, a, 
a medical doctor, for instance, because I don't have a license. I can say I'm a clinical social worker because that's my license, but there's no licensing of psychotherapists. So, so, you, so, so, so if you might have a shingle and said psychotherapist, you're, you're allowed to do it. Really? Well, technically, it, it differs from state to state. In oh, okay. Thank in you. Pennsylvania, clinical social workers do not call themselves a psychotherapist. In some areas, a psychologist would call themselves a psychotherapist. They're licensed as a psychologist. So, mm -hmm. it's more about the profession. Everything that psychotherapists are saying is a term that's more technically, clinical social workers can do that. But it's state. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we have what's called a title protection issues. And that protects those types. Call yourself this, you must have these credentials. Right. And I, have that with my I think that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. It's more about yeah. training. Like, I right. think it's more yeah. about what a person has done post lab training, reason for charges. Thank you. I, I, I don't want to split hairs, but I do want to say one thing that that, that character who, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, played the role of psychotherapist by saying, you trusted me yesterday, but don't trust me today. Being a psychotherapist does not mean manipulating people. I know you wouldn't uh, say that. He, he, this character um, uh, did an a, a impression of a psychotherapist by asking you something that was irrelevant to the issue. The issue was that you felt betrayed by him. And so he turned it back on you saying it's your problem. That's not good psychotherapy. And, and I'm, I'm sure you agree with that. Yeah. yeah, instead of either apologizing or maybe maybe recognizing that, well, you got it wrong, I didn't betray you. Yeah, yeah. Or, you yes. know, whatever. But he didn't do either of those things. He just right. turned it right on me right away. Right, exactly. Just yeah. one. Sorry. Well, one of the things that, that uh, I found early on when I first left the group, I I liked the therapist, but I felt that they didn't know enough. So I asked them if they would read uh, Yanya Lalich's book, uh, Captive Hearts, Captive Minds, I think it was the title at that time, and enthusiastically took that book, read it, and actually said after a few sessions, I would have treated you differently had I not read this. And that was huge for me. That was empowering. It, it made me feel... This is not the guru again. I agree, willing to be educated. I agree 100 percent. I agree 100 percent. I've also had um, therapists who are not cult aware who called me and uh, asked for a consultation with me. So this is what's going on with my client. Um, do you have any anything to say about that? And again, I consider that to be good practice. I get calls from um, young therapists who say to me, um, "I want to go into." On working with ex cult members, um, when you advise me, and I always give them the same advice, I say, get a good general background in your field psychology, uh, social work, psychiatry, whatever. I get as broad a background as you possibly can, then you can specialize. But if you specialize too soon, then you're going to see every symptom a person comes up with. You're, it, it, it's it's going to be automatic that you'll say, ah, they're, they don't trust authorities because they're going to call it. And, and that's, you, you can't automatically say that. You've got to know the individual. Ashley? Um, yeah, there's a um, question being asked by a virtual participant. Any familiarity or comments on intensive short term dynamic psychotherapy? Um, it's a method which aims to unlock the unconscious and how this or other styles might relate to cult survivors who still have cult, the cult persona. Um, I am, uh, a couple of things I need to say about this. First, there, this is a um, field of expertise, intensive short-term uh, therapy. And people that I respect and whose articles I have read um, believe that it's helpful. And I'm sure with some people it's helpful. I am, it is not quackery by any means. I mean, no, let me change that. that. That term is not used. That term is used by legitimate therapists. Of course, it's a generic term, so quacks can also say, this is what I provide. But, but there are plenty of good therapists that use 
um, intensive short-term therapy. It is not something that I do or feel comfortable with. Uh, I'm, I tend to be um, pretty conservative in my um, uh, uh, practice. I, I mentioned I'm a psychoanalyst. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a pretty rock bottom uh, um, uh, uh, ideology for, for uh, psychotherapy. Um, my, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble getting this out. I feel that it's more helpful for people to find out the genesis of their problems, not just to find symptom relief. And if, if a short-term therapist were here, they would object and say, we don't just do symptom relief, but very often it, you don't have to go into you know, their relationship with their hobby horse. You can just say to them, you know, this is the way you're thinking. What you're thinking is not helpful to you. And, and for some people, that's helpful. And for some people, the um, more painstaking, long-term approach that I would use is helpful. I don't want to say one is right and one is wrong. I just want to say it's not, that's not something that I feel is uncomfortable with. Um, but there's plenty of good therapists, good, legitimate uh, uh, ethical therapists who would use the short term. What's the difference between a psychotherapist and a psychologist? A psychotherapist is a generic term for somebody that works with people uh, who have emotional issues or, or um, uh, uh, behavioral issues. A psychologist is someone with a degree in psychology. Usually it's a PhD. A clinical social worker has a, an MSW master in social work, and they should have additional training. Um, like I, I graduated from a psychoanalytic institute that was for several years after I had my MSW. Um, I, and I, again, in New Jersey, and maybe not Pennsylvania, but in New Jersey, psychotherapy is, is a, uh, a generic term, um, and most most therapy in America is done by clinical social workers, um, uh, like I am. But but I am not a psychologist, um, and I'm not a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist uh, is a medical doctor, and psychiatrist can prescribe drugs. I'm not a psychiatrist. Can prescribe medicines that can help people to overcome uh, issues. And, and I often, often will refer to a psychiatrist. I don't, I, I think, um, uh, I think psychotherapy and um, medication therapy hand in hand for people with severe anxiety or depression can be very helpful. Just real quick, what, what, what level of degree did you say a psychologist is that? Uh, most psychologists have uh, PhDs. Oh, oh, That's PhD. called the, the terminal degree. Um, a psychologist with a master's in psychology, unless they've had a lot of experience, I, I would hesitate to refer to somebody with that credential unless I really knew them. I, mean, I can't think of anyone offhand, but I could conceive of somebody with a master's in psychology um, who I would refer to. Um, but usually the terminal degree for a psychologist is a PhD, terminal degree for social work is the MSW. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, once I have my degree in license, LSW, how do you find jobs that specialize in full recovery? Um, you ain't gonna find them. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question and yeah. I, I thank the court. No, wait. What I say to people is go to conferences, um, even, even watching on, on the internet. Uh, no, on the internet. What do you young people call that? The computer. <laughs> um, uh, you know, learn as much as you can and go to, to, go to conferences, get a sense of um, what kinds of papers people are presenting. And then I would say present a paper. Um, think about a way. Uh, you know, something that hasn't been um, uh, discussed in quite this way before. That's how you, you begin to get a reputation, to get known. And then once you start 
getting a reputation, um, your uh, clients refer friends and, and relatives to you. That's how you build a practice. But there's nobody now that will hire somebody whose specialization is called therapist as a full-time job. Second question. Thank you. And the second question is, Jilly Jenkinson suggests that therapy might be happening on the cult persona, not reaching the person underneath. So I'm assuming they're talking about the pseudo cult identity, which she calls right. it. Any comments on the challenges of the cult persona in therapy? Well, I think what you, know, what you want is somebody who's got as much experience in, in a situation like this, who's got enough experience to be able to recognize the, the, that pseudo personality. Now, Jilly, uh, as I know the individual that asked the, the question, uh, is a uh, experienced therapist, and I would feel very comfortable with her making that determination. But I think other people can also get a sense that there's something else that's going on here. One of, the, one of the things that I look at is, is the therapy after a, a good period of time being mutative? In other words, are there changes that I see? If we're going over the same material again and again and again, and the, uh, the individual isn't getting better, isn't changing things, then um, it, it's either I'm not explaining things well or we're really not getting to the, the heart of what's going on here. And um, that comes from, uh, from experience, from, uh, and, and, it, and it also comes, again, from getting to know the individual. So there's signs that you can see if, if uh, um, there, are, there are times I've had uh, uh, clients who uh, for years have, we've been discussing a, a certain issue, and then one day they say, oh, by the way, this happened to me. And the, the penny drops and, and they're realizing, my gosh, I wonder why you never told me that before. You never told me of importance. So, I, and, and I, I, on the other side, I work with plenty of former uh, cult members who saw a therapist and who never got to the fact that they were raised in the cult. As, as an issue. So, um, so I, I think her question, Jill's question is, is, is a good one, um, and it's, it's something that bears um, 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 exploration with a good experience there. Thank you. Is there an integration of the two? I mean, is, wouldn't that be part of the goal to integrate those two if you look at them separate? as a cult persona and? It, 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 it depends, it depends. I, it, some people assume the, the cult, the pseudo personality of the cult as a means of um, uh, getting by in an unhealthy situation. The, the talk I gave previously about the kids program, the, the member, the people that were involved in that program assume that pseudo identity as a way of surviving, surviving just getting past. Um, so there they had you know, two, they weren't separate personality, they didn't have a uh, identity disorder, but they had a way of, of um, uh, uh, surviving in that atmosphere. And then they might have brought some of that to the outside atmosphere when they didn't need it anymore. Um, I, uh, I, I do think that an integration of saying, uh, uh, this was something you used when you were in the cult. It might it was helpful for you in the cult, but maybe you don't need to use that anymore. Is is usually a very good intervention. Well, actually, just real quick, I thought what what Joan brought up was really interesting with the life coach phenomenon. Do you think <coughs> is this doomed to go? Badly, or is this something that could have some some positives? And the reason why I'm kind of stuck on it is, seeing the shrink's expensive, right? You know, making a buddy, or mm -hmm. even like a cuddle partner, if they call it that, like a platonic, like, hey, can you just smush? Yeah. So, like, you know, where does this fall? And is it like it's always going to go bad, or right? right. No, it, it isn't always going to go bad. Um, and the fact is that when somebody comes to a therapist. Let's say they come to me. 
I'm aware of the fact that the most people, they've exhausted all their friends and uh, family who are the people that usually give them advice. That's if, if they have good relationships with people. And when I say they've exhausted them, I mean that they've gone to those people and they, they give them advice and they go and, and it hasn't been helpful. But I'm, I'm aware of the fact that uh, uh, the first person that most of us go to is the first person we go to. It's, not, it's usually not a, a, a professional, it's usually a friend or a trusted person. And, and that's normal and helpful and perfectly legitimate and good. Um, so, so there's oftentimes that I'll say uh, to my clients, well, I'm sure you've discussed this with so-and-so, what is he or she say? <clears throat> the reason that I, I do that is because that gives us a, a springboard to talk about, is that helpful? Or, or sometimes, um, uh, I mean, if it's the, the joke, you know, uh, uh, um, like you, my husband, my wife tells me, um, is not helpful. But when I hear from the therapist, oh, no, no that makes sense to me. I, I see the role of the life coach quite different. Time management, the way you present yourself, do you exercise? You know, right, the therapist right. is dealing more with emotional issues. With psych with yeah, too, with this thing, this thing yeah, but, but I've had a number of cases now. Um, life coaches will specialize in a particular field, and it could be athletics, but it also could be in acting, for instance. And uh, in, up in New York, I went up. It's a longer story, but, but there was a life coach that came out of the Rantha group who was helping a group of young actors to learn to become better people, better actors, completely took over their lives. They weren't allowed to go out to auditions. He gave them diagnoses based on the DSM. He had no training in any kind of area. Uh, he ended up having sexual dominant relationships with several of the young women in the group. And through one of the older members who found out about me, we came up and got more than 11 out of the 15 of the group to come to my workshop. I got them all out in two sessions of two days of work. And uh, well, but then there was another case in Los Angeles. My daughter, who's been hacking out there, calls me one day and then another long story because I was concerned about her going to see this quote life coach out there to help her with acting. It turns out that this guy, after a year she found, or nine months found out that he was targeting the young men in his inner circle to a separate life coaching session and got the young men involved in lurid sexual acts to overcome their inhibitions. So he was kind of a homosexual predator that used life coaching as a way to get to his targets. And uh, of course my daughter being who she is, as soon as she found out she went got right in his face, told him what he was doing, <laughs> and uh, called me up. A good training. So I, I helped some of the young men over the phone and, and you know, in their recovery, and they had to go through a lot of therapy after that because they weren't homosexual and, and they got involved in all this. People, uh, when I speak yes. to general no. population, no, no, no. often will say, will, will say, um, my kids involved in this group is that a cult? <laughs> the answer is it's hard to define where a cult ends and another group begins. And it's not the right question to ask, although it's an understandable question. The right question is, how is this individual responding to the pressure they're being put under? Not everyone who's involved in a group that we would call a cult is under mind control. Um, a lot of them are, they go for a, a, a weekly vegetarian feast and, you know, like dance around and then, you know, whatever. For them, it's not a cult. But other people that are involved in groups that would not be cultic might be involved in a cultic way and, and similar to the acting coach, I worked with a group of people that were involved with a music teacher in New Jersey, and she had a cult. She gave lessons seven days a week. Um, that nobody could miss a lesson. These were aspiring singers. Um, for any reason, um, her son died of uh, muscular dystrophy, I think it was cerebral palsy. Um, and she gave lessons on the day of his funeral. And that was a um, masterful move on her part. Because then, anytime somebody from the group would say, I want to spend Father's Day with my father, she would get teary eyed. And she would say, I gave you a lesson on the day of my son's funeral. 
and you tell me that being with your father on Father's Day is more important than coming to my lesson? She had not read the bolos. And this was a music teacher. So just about anything can become a cult. The issue is not, is this group of cult or is this? The issue is what's happening to this individual? Um, someone asked a question. Are you saying you wouldn't refer to a licensed MFP? I'm assuming you're saying LMFP. Um, why or why not? I think just because oh, I, I would not. definitely re, re, uh, um, refer <laughs> to uh, somebody that didn't have the same credentials I had, as yeah. long as they were professional. Um, a, a marriage uh, counselor, a, a licensed marriage counselor are people that I respect. They have skills that I don't have. I have, I would and have referred to them, um, but I would always want to know what the credentials of the person are, and has anybody else, can, can somebody else tell you about the therapeutic connection? Okay, I'm not going to drag this on. Thank you for your attention.